Good morning, class. It's a nice cloudy day here in Florida, but I'm happy to record this lecture for you um, away from school. I hope everybody's doing well. This is an exciting lecture for me. This is finally the lecture that I've been hinting at, uh, or I, I should say it's the first of a series of lectures that I've been hinting at all semester long, where we're going to get in and we're going to talk about site response. You'll recall that site response is this portion of the um, modification of a ground motion when the ground motion is making its way to the ground surface. So we have an earthquake, the waves travel through the earth, and they start refracting upwards, upwards, and eventually they start making their way through very soft soil layers and find their way to the ground surface where then they extend out as surface waves. Um, this process of the waves traveling through upwards through the soil and being modified and amplified or deamplified is what we refer to as site response. And uh, it's a very important function of geotechnical earthquake engineering. It, it gives us the ability to predict how a particular soil column or, or local site conditions are going to impact um, ground motions that are coming from the rock below. <clears throat> and, and we know that this is an important um, concept in earthquake engineering. We've seen it in a lot of different earthquakes, like the 1985 Mexico City earthquake, 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, and we've seen it with numerous other earthquakes, that the local site conditions play a big part in what the intensity of the ground motions is that you feel. So it, the research in site response began in the 1970s and it's continued um, since then. It got really hot and heavy in the 1980s, particularly toward the end of the 1980s into the early 1990s because of the Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, for instance, like Dr. Rollins uh, got a lot of his start doing a lot of site response work uh, as, as an early researcher. The research continues today, but we're not so much concerned with can we do it. Now we're more concerned with how do we do it in a way that's realistic and how do we quantify or, or even properly represent the uncertainties in the problem. That's kind of where our research focus is today. So uh, a couple of things. We're going to be talking about linear systems today. Linear systems are the most basic system of any type of, of material. And it's a great starting point to introduce the idea or topic of site response to you. And certainly they're the most uh, basic and the easiest to analyze. Um, We've talked a little bit about transfer functions. Transfer functions, again, are a function that will allow us to go from um, the base all the way to the top in one single mathematical step. Linear systems, because they're elastic, allow us to derive mathematical transfer functions that can allow us to account for site response in one single step. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, you recall when we talk about single degree of freedom systems, uh, you know, this is a little more realistic looking single degree of freedom system, but it, it really is the same thing as our lollipop. With a single degree of freedom system, we have some stiffness, K, okay, and we have some damping associated with our single degree of freedom system. <clears throat> a transfer function is a function that, that's um, derived, it's an equation that allows us to go directly from the input motion at the base all the way up to what the output motion would be in our single degree of freedom system or the, what the motion would be in the mass. Thus, in, by way of review, the peak motion from the mass would be the response spectrum from the input motion. Now, um, this system of the single degree of freedom oscillator, especially if it's a linear system, 
And, and notice, by the way, that, that when I say linear system, it doesn't exclude damping. You can have a linear system that's damped, okay? So this single degree of freedom system, we're going to liken it or, or, or use it to represent what we're interested in as geotechnical engineers, which is a soil layer overlying bedrock. So we're going to treat this soil layer as kind of like a single degree of freedom system that has its own dynamic properties like shear wave velocity, shear modulus, damping, and a mass density. So anytime we deal with linear elastic systems, the main assumption is, it's a big one, that our dynamic properties do not change. And that is a huge assumption because we just spent the last couple lectures discussing how dynamic properties do change. I mean, do you remember modulus reduction curves, damping curves? That as we strain the soil, the soil loses stiffness. And so its shear modulus decreases, its damping increases. But with linear systems, we're going to make the assumption that these dynamic properties will not change with strain. And you may wonder, in what world would this ever be useful or realistic? Um, you're going to see that it is going to be useful to us because we're going to trick the analysis into taking something that is um, certainly nonlinear and, and certainly not elastic, but tricking the analysis into thinking it is. We're not going to do that in this lecture, but we'll, we'll do that um, in the next lecture. By way of review, when we talk about transfer functions, you're going to remember that um, if I start with, say, a base ground motion and convert it into the um, frequency domain using a fast Fourier um, uh, transform, then uh, we get our Fourier amplitude spectrum. That's a, a function of the frequency. And then if I compute a transfer function for whatever my system is, whatever my single degree of freedom system is, the transfer function might look something like this where it's going to resonate at a certain frequency and then at uh, you know, the other frequencies it'll be lower. And if we multiply our Fourier amplitude spectrum by our transfer function, we get the Fourier amplitude spectrum for our structure, what are the, the mass of our structure. So this is like, um, if I'm liking this to soil, this would be like the bedrock. This would be the site response. And then this would be the ground motion at the top of the ground. And um, the notation that we're going to use for transfer functions, we're going to use this um, capital F as our notation. And then it's a function, of course, of omega, which is the frequency of our loading. And um, so that that should give us sufficient review for our transfer functions. Now we're going to analyze uh, a few different cases of elastic soil. Um, the case number one is going to be the most basic and, and, and certainly the most unrealistic case. This is where we have a homogeneous, undamped soil on rigid rock. Um, homogeneous meaning the, the soil is completely uniform, its properties are the same no matter where you are, and undamped means that it's perfectly, not only perfectly elastic, but it maintains its energy and will never lose energy as the waves bounce around up and down the, the soil. So we can derive what the transfer function is going to be by computing what the ground motion is going to be at the top versus what the ground motion is at the bottom and then taking the ratio of the two. So um, right here in our derivation, we have the solution to the wave equation, the one-dimensional wave equation. And then we also need our um, strain compatibility equations. 
And if we combine the strain compa compatibility with the solution to the wave equation, we're going to get a generalized um, equation of motion for this case number one. Okay, here's the deal. Like We may know shear modulus. We may know the um, wave number. We may know the frequency of the loading. We may know the depth below the ground. But we have some constants here that are tricky. We have a constant A and a constant B. Okay, uh, that's tricky. How do we get those? Well, we're going to use boundary equations uh, or boundary conditions, I mean. Whenever we solve any sort of differential equation, you always rely on your boundary conditions to come up with the, the solutions for your, your different coefficients. So at the ground surface, at our depth equals zero, we know that the stress is going to equal zero. And if the stress is going to equal zero, that means then that A has to equal B. So if A equals B, then we can just swap that out for A and simplify the equation. And by doing that, we end up with this equation right here. And then if we substitute in, um, or we take this equation and we substitute in our, um, at the depth, at the bottom of the soil layer, so at a depth of h, so z equals h at time t, if we take then this ratio of the, uh, of the displacement at the top versus the displacement at the bottom, and we simplify it, you can see the 2's cancel out, the A's cancel out, the um, complex numbers cancel out, and the cosine of 0 goes to a value of 1. And so all we're left with then is this equation right here. Which if we want to swap out the wave number and substitute in the propagation velocity and um, the circular frequency of the loading, we can do that as well. So if we were to plot this function then, um, this this transfer function as a function of, of wave number times height, what we would see is that it's just a repetitive function that every time it comes up against one of these harmonic frequencies it goes to infinity which means that every time it hits one of the um, resonating nodes or one of the harmonic frequencies of the soil, the soil is going to shake itself like crazy. Um, and so each one of those is what we would call a harmonic. So uh, the point would be then that I could take this transfer function, multiply it by the Fourier amplitude spectrum, and then come back out with the Fourier amplitude spectrum of at the top of my soil. Okay, well, um, you obviously can guess one of the problems with this particular transfer function is I got stuff going all the way up to infinity, which means my Fourier amplitude spectrum is going to be um, approaching infinity at each of these harmonic um, frequencies as well. And so, um, let's introduce then a little bit of damping. So case two, we're going to keep the same homogeneous soil, but this time we're going to add some damping properties to that um, homogeneous soil. So again, we're going to go back. Um, here's our strain compatibility equation. Um, you're going to see it's a little bit different than it was last time. This time we have a viscous damping um, component into the strain compatibility equation. And then here's our one dimensional wave equation that we need to solve. And you can see it has a damping component added into it. And this then is uh, if we do the uh, solve the differential equation, this is going to be the solution to the wave equation.
And again, we have some coefficient A and some coefficient B that we're going to have to eventually deal with. Also, you're going to see these little stars on the wave number, and you'll remember then that this is the um, complex wave number. And as I indicated to you guys in class, anytime you see that star, just remember that that means damping. Damping is included now in this number. And we can uh, substitute out the wave number for any number of things. We can use the complex shear wave velocity if we wanted to, uh, which is a function of the complex shear modulus. Oh dear, I've got the hiccups. I apologize for that. And the complex shear modulus is a function of our damping ratio. So if we substitute that back into our complex um, shear velocity, we can simplify it down to this equation right here, and which we could substitute back into our wave number equation. And we get a value that um, is not precisely equal to, but approximately equal to this value if we rely upon um, some approximations for small angle uh, strains or deformations from trigonometry. And so we can simplify that relationship down using this nice little number right here. So I can take then um, my solution for the um, undamped, which remember was just the one over the cosine of the wave number times the thickness of my layer. And I'm going to, instead of having just the regular wave number, now I'm going to have the complex wave number. And I can simplify that substituting this in right here for the wave number. And I end up with this nice little equation right here. And again, using some more um, small deformation or, or, or small angles uh, approximations, we know that the cinch squared of y is approximately equal to y squared for small values of y, which we anticipate to have. Uh, because we're not, you know, apocalyptically straining the soil. We're just applying some small deformations as waves pass through it. If that's the case, then that larger equation simplifies down to this approximate equation right here. And this function right here, then, is our um, transformation, uh, or I'm sorry, our transform function for the damped case. And we, like before, we can swap out um, the wave number for the frequency and the propagation velocity if we wanted to, and that's what's shown in this bottom equation. Now, if we go and plot again this amplification function or this transfer function as a function again of, of k times h, instead of all of these harmonics going to infinity like they were before, you can see that the first harmonic is the largest and then for every subsequent harmonic after that it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and so that represents our damping in addition if we look at or, or put in different levels of damping like there's five percent damping uh, but look what happens if we double the damping and go to ten percent our curve went from this peak all the way down to this peak just by doubling the damping. And if I double it again up to 20%, it goes down even more. And so you can see damping in our soil can play a big role. Uh, a couple things I want to introduce to you about harmonics, though, of soil that, that I think you're going to find interesting. Um, the the harmonic that we're most interested in is, is the first harmonic. That's the one that always has the largest amplification, and so it's the, really the only one that we care about. And so we're going to call that harmonic the fundamental frequency of our soil profile, and we're going to call that omega naught. So omega naught, then, is going to be equal to um, pi times the shear wave velocity of our soil divided by 2 times its thickness. And we can derive that. Um, if we want to use period instead of circular frequency, we can. Uh, 
So um, we can just say then that the uh, we can relate the circular frequency to the natural period of our soil profile. And if we do some more algebra, then we can compute what the natural period is of our soil profile. And that's simply going to be equal to um, this equation right here, where the natural period is equal to four times the thickness of our homogeneous soil layer divided by its shear wave velocity. And that is a very important equation, and it comes in um, handy a lot of times when we're dealing with site response. So anytime you want to know what the natural period is or approximate what the natural period of a soil column is, just multiply its thickness by four and divide by the average shear wave velocity and that should get you in the ballpark of what its natural period is. If I have a multi-layer soil system, then um, I can use just a geometric mean or I'm sorry, just a simple arithmetic mean to compute uh, or approximate this shear wave velocity. So um, you recall that the arithmetic mean is simply the um, it's going to be the summation of the height or the thickness of a particular soil layer times its corresponding shear wave velocity all divided by the summation of the thicknesses of the soil layer. So it's just a weighted average based on the thickness of the soil layer. So if I plug that in, if I plug that in for our shear wave velocity, that's where I get this equation right here. So this is what I would use if I had like a, a multi-layer system. Okay. Let's move on. Let's move on to case number three. This time, we're going to do something a little bit different. Now before, um, and I didn't call this out. Before, I had perfectly rigid rock, which meant that, um, think about impedance. When waves come down and hit something that's perfectly rigid, uh, that rock doesn't deform or move at all. Instead, the waves perfectly get reflected, um, and stress, you know, the, the rock will feel stress, but it doesn't experience any displacement. That's not the case in reality. In the case of reality, rock will actually take waves and they'll be um, transmitted waves as well as reflected waves. And so it, it's a little more accurate if we treat rock elastically. So um, in this condition, case number three, we're going to keep our damp soil. We're going to still keep it homogeneous, but this time we're going to make our rock elastic which means that our rock is also going to have a shear modulus, it's going to have a mass density, and it's going to have, um, it's not damped yet though, we're not going to add any damping yet to the rock. So we can um, formulate then our solutions to our wave equations. using this way, but um, what I have is I have a, a, a solution for my soil and I have a solution for my rock. So S is going to denote soil, <coughs> R is going, to, is going to denote rock. So you see the soil has its own complex wave number and the rock is going to have its own complex wave number. And Z sub R is depth below the top of the rock and Z sub S is depth below the top of the soil. And then we're going to have our own coefficients for the soil. And we're going to have our own coefficients for the rock. So things are getting pretty hairy pretty quickly. Um, now we know that uh, from the previous cases that we've solved that the coefficients for the soil equal one another as we derived in case number one. We also know a couple of other things. We know that right at the boundary between the soil and the rock, that the displacement in the soil 
has to equal the displacement in the rock. And that, that's in order to maintain um, strain compatibility. And we also know that the stress right at that boundary in the soil has to equal the stress right at that boundary in the rock. And that's to maintain stress compatibility. So if we take those relationships and we begin to simplify um, these two solutions to the wave equations, we can solve for what the coefficients are in the rock. And I'm going to call that equation number one. So then if we plug um, that relationship in back into the wave equation um, for the rock and the soil, and then rearrange it, we can uh, develop this solution right here that I'm going to call equation number two. Now, if we um, then take this portion of the equation, you're going to see that this uh, we can modify this portion of the equation down to something that looks a little more familiar. Um, if we just modify the shear modulus and convert it back to mass density and modify the wave number and convert it back to the propagation velocity, we end up with uh, the mass density times the propagation velocity for the soil and the rock. And what we end up seeing is um, this looks awfully lot like, do you remember, the impedance ratio. The only difference is it has a little star, which of course you know means there's damping involved. So this is complex impedance ratio as we travel between two damped, or, um, or, or we travel from a damped material into a material that, that is still elastic. So that's why we're going to call it this complex impedance ratio. Um, Actually, I'm going to take it back. It looks like um, the rock is damped as well because it is complex. So um, we do have damping apparently in the rock. It is elastic as well. So um, if we substitute and simplify, uh, put this impedance ratio back into the equation, and we use equations 1 and 2 to solve for AR and BR respectively, we come and, and we get a solution for each of those terms. And you see, I mean, these aren't nice, pretty solutions. They're, they're kind of tricky. So um, if we continue to modify the math on those equations and break them down and simplify them, what we get is the ratio then of um, the A term on in the soil versus the A term in the rock. And that ratio, by definition, is the same thing as our transfer function. So then we can just swap um, the equations for a sub s and a sub r in and simplify them and break them down, and we get this guy right here. Then if we simplify things further using Euler's law, I know you guys don't like Euler's law because it involves imaginary numbers, but it does simplify stuff down we can rewrite that equation using this right here, which then we can break down um, if we don't like, by the way, that's our transfer function. If we don't like using the wave number, we can put things in terms of propagation velocity and circular frequency. Um, but what I want to point out is that now that we have an elastic rock, it just makes sense that we have now these terms of the impedance ratio because now we have a material that is going to have a transmitted wave as well as a reflected wave when the whenever energy comes down and hits that impedance boundary so uh, we, we have to account for that impedance now if we assume that the damping was zero just for the sake of kicks and giggles, then um, the transfer function would break down and would look something like this, which if we plotted it, guess what it would look like? Ta-da! What happens every time we approach one of the harmonics? That's right, goes to infinity, which is basically the exact same solution as um, we got in case number one. 
So that just is kind of a check we can run to show that, hey, things are working. But um, look what happens when we have an impedance ratio of 0 0.1. All of a sudden, stuff goes, um, it is quite a bit more damp. And if we have even a higher impedance ratio of 0 0.5, it's almost, it's, it's almost a straight line right at 1. There's almost no difference at all between the two. So, what's the moral to take from this story? The moral is that resonance in the soil cannot occur as long as there's impedance between the rock and the soil. And that's important to note because if there was no impedance, all of our site response analyses would predict some frequency at which the ground motions just go crazy. But we don't ever see the ground motions going crazy, uncontrolled, at any frequency in the real world. So resonance cannot exist if there's any impedance between the rock and the soil. All right, so let's introduce then the final case. And this, this is kind of like the nightmare case. Um, because everything we've talked about thus far has been homogeneous soil. But what would happen if I introduced um, heterogeneous soil or layered soil that's damped and sitting on elastic rock. And so now this case is going to be a lot more realistic. Um, but you have to remember that we're still making the fundamental assumption that shear modulus, that our shear wave velocity, and that the damping ratio um, are, do not change with strain, which we know is not true. But still, we're, we're getting closer and closer to reality. So with this case four solution, now um, what we have basically is a whole bunch of lots of little bits of transfer functions. We have a transfer function here in this little layer. We have a transfer function here in this little layer. We have a transfer function here in this little layer and then we have all these little individual transfer functions but ultimately what we care about is the big transfer function from the bottom all the way to the top so what we have to do is come up with the solutions for one individual layer so these are the um, wave equation solutions for layer M, some layer in our soil profile. So we have the top of layer M, which is U sub M, and then we have the bottom of layer M, which is U M sub 1. We're going to do the same thing we did in case number 3. We're going to rely upon our boundary um, compatibility equations with stress and with displacement uh, to try to simplify down our coefficients that we get from our um, the, the solutions of our uh, differential equations. So that's uh, these guys right here. There's displacement compatibility. There's strain compatibility. We substitute those in and we get a solution um, for A and B at the lower portion of the boundary. We'll call that equation one. Simplify things uh, a little bit further to get equation two. And again, we're going to introduce our complex um, impedance ratio for that particular sublayer. We're going to use equations one and two to solve for A and B at the lower boundary. And there's the solution right there. So you're going to see that this is very, very similar to case number three except that we're not necessarily on the rock. We're just at the boundary between two subsequent soil layers in the system. And these little uh, fellas, A and B, are what we call the recursion formulae. And these we're going to repeat over and over and over and over for every layer or sublayer that we have in our soil profile. So if, now, if we take the free face displacements, at the very top of our ground. With successive evaluations of the recursion formulae that we just derived, 
um, we can define these two equations right here. Oops. And these equations are going to relate the displacement wave amplitudes, that's these A and, and B, in any layer to that of the top layer, which is what we're really interested in. So here are the, um, the amplitudes at the very top of the ground, and we can relate them back to the amplitudes at any other layer in our soil profile using those recursion formulae. So the transfer function for this is just going to be relating the displacement amplitude to layer I, some layer, or, or M, I guess, of interest to that of layer J is just going to be uh, this function right here, where it's just going to be the ratio of these um, little a and little b values from the recursion formulae. So by now, I'm guessing that you're probably half glazed over and lost. Um, and, and I don't blame you, because when we start getting to case number four, the mathematical solution to, to solving and, and developing the transfer functions between any layers is hairy, to say the least. And it becomes very, very complicated, if not impossible, to do by hand. Therefore, numerous computer codes have been developed over the years that will solve these recursion formulae solutions for us. One of the earliest codes that's still kicking in the world today is, is called Shake. It was developed in the early 70s. Um, I think Shake 71, I think, was the official name of it. And it's very, very popular. Um, and so it will, you can put in any layered soil system and it will solve transfer functions between any layer of interest that, you're, that you want. And so, you know, given that you know the ground motions in one layer, you can compute what the ground motions are in another. Um, the guy who wrote our textbook, Steve Kramer, and uh, some of his students have developed a different code that, that is similar to Shake, but it, it really is its own algorithm, and uh, frankly, it's more stable, and it's faster under many conditions, and, and it's called ProShake. Um, I like ProShake a lot, and it's, it's, if you talk to Professor Kramer, he'll explain it this way. ProShake is like the Cadillac of elastic site response analysis. Um, it's very user-friendly, it's very easy to operate and, and run, very intuitive, but it's very expensive, just like a Cadillac. And so there is an educational version, and, and if you search ProShake on the Internet, you can download that educational version. Um, I'm not a fan of the educational version of ProShake because it limits you to using just three ground motions, which um, I think is kind of stinky. But, you know, I understand why Professor Kramer is doing that. Um, now, another one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Yusef Hashash from the University of Illinois, developed a powerful program called Deep Soil. Deep Soil can do elastic site response, um, nonlinear site response through uh, what we call equivalent nonlinear. Uh, to be fair, ProShake does that as well. Um, but deep soil will also do an effective stress-based, fully nonlinear site response analysis, which is very powerful and very, very cool, but also very sophisticated and difficult to do correctly. Um, the thing that I like about these deep soil is that if you're a student, you get a free license to the fully operational program of deep soil. Now, um, you, my students, can go to Deep Soil, or go to this web address right here, and you can download a copy of Deep Soil. And in fact, you're going to need to for an upcoming homework assignment. Now, I'm telling you to register to get your free copy. Um, Professor Hashash is a good friend of mine, and last year he said, please stop having your students register because I don't like getting 30 emails you know, asking for codes. Um, instead, he requested that um, I just make a request for the class uh, 
he'll give me a code and then one code and then I'll distribute that code to all of you and that should work to get your copies up and running uh, of deep soil so um, what are the things that we want to take from this uh, this lecture okay let's maybe summarize some of this stuff um, the first lesson that I want to take is that um, elastic linear solutions to site response are easy now you're going whoa easy you know all those derivations and stuff well, I didn't get that at all I, I don't understand that yeah I know but that's because you're just seeing it for the first time um, the fact that people can derive these uh, equations, simplify them, break them down using traditional differential equations, um, that constitutes my term of easy. Okay, um, If a computer can solve a solution in, in a blink of an eye using one simple mathematical equation or one simple calculation, then trust me, um, it, it's what we refer to as easy. Um, elastic solutions are not real but can still be useful the the biggest uh, benefit to elastic solutions folks is that they're quick and they're stable. I've performed many site response analyses and trying to use nonlinear methods we get stuff that just doesn't make sense or it doesn't convolve to a solution or converge to a solution um, and we always fall back on the elastic solutions just to get us in the ballpark and, and to help us feel better about the stuff that we're computing with more sophisticated methods. So elastic solutions are still widely used in consulting and engineering design today. Um, maybe not for final design, but they are a very useful tool. Um, using elastic solutions, we can account for damping in the soil and the rock, which is very useful. And as we showed in um, case number three the, it, it does explain why we don't see huge you know uncontrollable resonance in soil uh, because there's always going to be impedance between the soil and the, its underlying bedrock um, and thank goodness for that and um, number four what I want you to take away from this is that with multi-layer systems using recursion formulae we can um, solve the displacements and or stresses for any layer in the system given we know the um, displacement Uh, slash stress at another layer and what does this mean well again you know I could have a, a multi-layer system and I have bedrock down here and here's the top of my ground really what I'm interested in is the motion at the top um, so I can get the motion at the top if I have the motion or the stress in any of the other layers. Well, what do you think we're going to put in as input? 
we're going to be putting in time histories into the bedrock which then lets us know what the motion is or the stress and given that we can solve what the motion is at the top of our soil layer in one single mathematical equation using a transfer function um, which is extremely powerful uh, so that's that's ultimately what I want you guys to take from um, this lecture today so what are the advantages to the linear approach uh, there's a couple of them like I mentioned it's fast we get a direct mathematical solution um, there are conditions in the world where the elastic linear solutions really aren't that bad and do not deviate that far from the actual solutions and those would be for very stiff soil or rock or and or very small ground motions where we're putting in very very minimal strains into the soil and the whole idea behind that is um, again if that is shear modulus versus strain if I have a very small strain that I'm applying to the soil it's going to behave nearly linearly where G is going to equal G max so small ground motions that aren't going to strain my soil very much are going to induce small strains and hopefully keep that soil pretty linear and then um, we haven't talked about this yet but we will um, transfer functions go both ways meaning I can do what's called deconvolution we'll talk a little bit more about deconvolution and the dangers associated with it the idea of deconvolution is um, what if I know a ground motion on the ground surface um, then I can use a transfer function that will take that motion from the ground surface back down to the ground motion on the bottom of my soil on the rock and uh, the reason this is useful is it's easier to record actual earthquake ground motions on the ground surface than it is to record them you know hundreds of feet below the ground on the bedrock and so uh, a lot of researchers have kind of embraced the idea of taking ground motions that were been recorded on soil and then using deconvolution to put them back down on the rock in their models and then run the motion back up again through the soil um, there's some things to be aware of though that we need to be careful of if we do that but you know again it's an advantage to the linear approach that we can we can deconvolve motions and send them back down to the soil and it's not just a one-way street um, and, and all these sound great but we we have to keep in mind that there is one really big disadvantage to the linear approach and, and it that big advantage is that it does not account directly for the soil nonlinearity that assumption that our soil dynamic properties do not change with strain is a bad assumption um, and, and but we're going to show you some solutions or ways that we can deal with that assumption and trick the system into thinking that the system is linear when it's really not so that's the end of this presentation thanks so much for your attention and um, I'll look forward to in the next lecture introducing the idea of equivalent linear site response analysis the equivalent meaning we're going to trick the soil into thinking it's a linear analysis but in reality it's not it's a nonlinear analysis so I can't wait to show you thanks guys have a great day